Hi kids, this is episode 425 of Culture Doom. This is Alex, who's very uh, angry and adamant about ad block. Alex is getting agitated by YouTube's new ad blocking policies. Um, I was watching a video about how it probably is going to backfire for... You know, he made a very good case. I'll put... Louis Rossman? No, it was um, some just some guy <laughs> who was talking about how this is really going to pad the numbers for advertisements that advertisers don't want to, to see because mm-hmm. if people who use ad block are clearly people who ads are not going to are not working for no one who no no one who want, uses any kind of ad block extension is going to pay attention to the commercials so basically it's diluting the market market research that these for- advertisers want yeah, for for instance, on you probably if you watch it on on your phone, you probably have to have your ads. And if I'm watching it on my iPhone, I, oh, no, you don't. Oh, because no you have something. But since I use Apple, Apple, whatever. So the ads I consistently get on there are Expedia, some cl- women's clothing called Sheen or Shane or Shine or whatever the heck it is. Which if they if the if the advertising knew what my view history is like, it's a whole bunch of pepe stuff um <laughs> you just watch pepe i'm not memes. the target dog <laughs> what's the um like you the birth, birth, birth of the birth, birth of the honkler who's the guy <laughs> who does the he does really good little uh pepe animations good boy points no need for cash doing chores around the house always a blast got my good boy points that's all i need in my life if i got them everything is all right mama's boy no call me a good boy thug just stay in bed all day got my pizza. the ads that i've had to watch without ad block are just like um or it's like uh some sport online sports betting crap and it's like uh What's it, what betting, do you think this betting, is family friendly television that's on YouTube? And then they, now, now that, yeah, but like, like, uh, yeah, like DraftKings. DraftKings, thank yeah. you. Or, um, or a lot of people, they do like, they're still not as many VPN sites, but I still see like Raid Channel Legends, you know, or a lot of people now, they, a lot of channels just do in video advertising type of sponsor things and stuff, you know. So they're like, hey, Ridge Wallet, which, I don't know, man. Seventy-five bucks for this thing that just squishes your stuff. I squish your head. I, I squish your head. I'm to squishing your head. I have to pay seventy-five dollars to get my stuff squished. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, Alex, it's the day. Send me her digits. <laughs> it's the it's the day after Halloween. Uh, how was how was how was Halloween at the at your residence? Yes, Alex. Alex didn't want to waste his background, so. We're, We've got yeah, it back. We've yeah. got it, back. <laughs> it was good. Um, unfortunately, the weather, as you know, living in the Midwest is always atrocious. And as ever since we were kids, it's always been a terrible, terrible time to there get were quite, There were quite a few kids out last night for in Chicago. So yeah, there was some. They they ventured out. They soldiered on. You know, neither you know, cold, wind, um, snow, like some say, flurries was, and stuff. It was snowing in Chicago. Yeah. If you, um, it's always been just a terrible time and I, I you know you take a look at you watch something like hocus pocus or even like the halloween movie and you just see like this perfect type of you know how it's, well, like, no, it's a movie in southern california it's a movie yeah, it's in southern california but, uh, but it's uh, like halloween famously takes place in indiana but there's palm trees <laughs> yeah yeah um same with uh the office mm. there's been a few shots where they're driving through and like why is there a like palm tree in like eastern pennsylvania um but yeah, but the boys, we soldier, we went to one house, uh, one of his, um, Nicholas's pre-K teacher's house, and then we went to the Presbyterian church in next town over. Excuse they were doing me. Like, I, was, I was doing reconnaissance for his, uh, for his holiness. Well, I'm glad that they went out. I was worried that they were, go- that you guys were going to um, let them kind of wuss out over going out and experiencing the br- brutality of... Midwest Halloween, <laughs> Midwest Halloween, <laughs> where the where the elements Terrible. are far more terrifying than the actual, um, God, the the ghosts and goblins. The ghosts and goblins are like, screw that, I'm not going out in the cold. Yeah, <laughs> staying by the I fire. F- there was a picture of me when I was a little kid, and it's like I, I guess it was a spaceman costume or something, and it's just basically me with my wearing like a snowsuit <laughs> and then the costume over mm-hmm. it. Like, well, so you your boys I went as Mario thing. and Luigi, right? 
Mario and Luigi, so and even we just with, put their hats and you yeah. Know, so even with the over. coat on, they it's still de- and then like with the mustache, really demonstrative. They didn't have mustaches. They didn't keep the mustaches. <laughs> they, they, we were gonna, Erica was gonna go and paint the little mustaches. Yeah, but we never got around to. We never even thought about See, doing that. But we're going to a friend's Halloween the, party on Saturday, which they you can can't, do the whole thing. You can't. I know. Have I, know ha- I know. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. You can't have a Halloween party after Halloween. Hey man, I had to venture inside of a Methodist, uh, a, a Presbyterian church. I don't know what was happening. I, got, <laughs> I, I didn't know what was thro- happening. I was already thrown for a loop. Well, I'm glad that you guys had a good Halloween and they get a bunch of ch- candy. They do all right. They did decently. Yeah, I'd say they had Decent. they had the plastic, the classic. I saw them at Walmart. The classic plastic pumpkins with the handle. Mm-hmm. They're like a buck something each. I got two of them. I'm like this is going to last you guys for years. For years. Um, <laughs> I think they got like probably like a third of the pumpkin filled up based upon just where we went and they're they're happy nobody nobody complained everybody had, i said hey did you boys have a good time tonight trick-or-treating they're like yeah 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 good so, oh that's good so it's yeah. it's it's strange to me how trick-or-treating has dwindled so much kids love it yeah. So yeah i don't i don't do. understand what the what's the problem is it just I've, lazy parents that's disgusting. lazy parents combined with um uh, I'd say society, um, societal kind of neglect as to trying to promote an old kind of like annual tradition of kids just getting to dress up and go outside, getting some exercise um, <laughs> yeah, before they I, gorge themselves in candy. I think it's but, it's just kind of been kind of passed over and but 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 cultural, neglected really. But culturally, we still. Um, romanticize Halloween mm. and movies especially continue movies to romanticize shows, yeah. Halloween and the kids going out and yeah. so I don't understand why there, I feel like it's promoted just fine in popular culture and that mm-hmm. it's sort of like and like it's almost like just become an adults party weekend yeah. so not even Halloween specifically but p- adults getting dressed up and going out mm-hmm. and going to bars and having costume contests and stuff yeah. like that well, also, well, the thing is, like, the ones that are, well, like you said, the current adults are basically people our age and older, and maybe a few years, probably f- up to five, six years younger than us doing that, but it's like, when the people younger than that eventually become older, are they still going to be wanting to do that based upon, you know, because if the thing is, if there's a diminishing number of kids that are going out trick-or-treating, they don't really, why would they continue? It's kind of like kids playing soccer, you know, kids play soccer up until a certain age in the U.S., and then they kind of stop because they don't care anymore. Oh, you're you know? frozen. Did you, um, is Erica watching Netflix tonight? She's probably watching Suits or something. Suits? Oh, there we I'm go. Back. You're back. Alex yeah, is that's back. what she's binge watching now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I would I, I would say, it, you know, it, dep- it, it might also be a regional thing. Who knows? You know, we, we, we don't have anybody actually on the ground. Uh, you know, taking a look at the hard facts as to what the situation is with Halloween and stuff. Well, I'll put it so. this way. My mom lives in the largest suburb of out in Illinois, outside of Chicago. She had, did you, well, you guys went out with your kids, so there wasn't, we, she said she got about 30 trick-or-treaters. That's a good, that's a good number. Good it number. doesn't, but it, that's not, it used to be being, it used to be like 90, 100. I know, but I'm saying that in, in current year in, terms, in it's like 30 is it actually a good showing. Well, the yeah. other problem is, is that they, they've set up trick or treat hours to be, it's like five to seven and that's it. Mm-hmm. I think that's. We had six to eight, I think for us. That sounds. But like, it's already dark at six. That much, I mean, well, it should be dark when you're out trick or treating, to be mm-hmm. honest, but it's also like kind of, it's too early. People aren't even getting home from work at five. No, you still got to have dinner and stuff. Like we made sure the boys had dinner. We had eaten before we even started doing right. anything. But I mean, as a, as a, as a single person who, if I had a house, I would want to, I'd have to like say I'm leaving work early so I can make it at five to give candy to kids. You know, mm-hmm. it's just kind of like, let's get it, let's get it together. Mm-hmm. Society. Um, I think it's just, yeah, I think it just kind of, is almost like, Woeful neglect of yeah. something. So, speaking of uh, the decline of Western civilization, oh god, more. Uh, of it. We were talking earlier about Best Buy not stocking <laughs> Blu-ray any or stock, stocking movies, DVD or Blu-ray. Mm-hmm. They 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 gave up on CDs 
probably a decade ago, I think. Yeah, uh, with the I'm surprised advent. that the films have stayed on there. I guess there was enough of a market for it until it finally Amazon. I mean, I buy Blu-rays of movies that I really like, so I have like ten Blu-rays. But there are, and there's Blu-rays that I would buy that I just haven't gotten around to. Like 2001, I should get a Blu-ray of. Um, mm-hmm. But it just feels like the the heyday of physical media was VHS and DVD, and in a certain in a way, DVD kind of was the pinnacle because that was when most people got to have commentaries and extras and stuff that was usually just on Laserdisc. Right. Mm -hmm. Something that definitely is not... uh, Very little do you find is sometimes on um, streaming media. And if usually mm -hmm. if you do, then it's pretty much just going to be like maybe the trailer for the film. Ooh. (laughs) So Um, exciting. Yeah. But uh, but none of the comment Like... I love speaking of like director's commentary. Uh, two of my favorite commentaries are uh, the one on Euro Trip. There's two versions of the commentary. There's one which the producer, like the, the like writer's director, they do it sober, and then there's another one where they do, we do it and they make a drinking game and they get super hammered and they invite pe- they in, they order pizza. They invite the the pizza delivery guy to watch the movie with them when he shows up. Then they they're like calling their wives and stuff. It's hilarious. Um, and then the other one, I don't know why, but it's all the commentaries that Johnny Depp did for the Pirates movies. <laughs> and just listening to Johnny Isn't Depp, is he just, in character for those also or no? No, I think he's okay. just he's just yeah he's just doing Johnny Depp. But him talking about like oh yeah he's a great actor you know is in the shot and so just it's kind of. You know, when you kind of, it's fun to hear an actor doing a commentary on a film that they actually are enjoying. Because otherwise, just like, oh, yeah, this was this. This is what happened next. You know, just like, I'm like, you must be one of those actors that never watches the films that they're in, right? You're <laughs> one of those douchebags. Okay. Um, What was I going to say? Oh, my but, favorite one was uh, Boogie Nights. Boogie Nights has oh, multiple has multiple tracks. Yeah, I've got that on Blu-ray. I should watch. I should watch that one. It's, time. Oh, you got it on Blu-ray. Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. It's, if I have, if it's a movie that I I've, I've wanted to get for a while and it's available on DVD or Blu-ray, I'll just go and get the Blu-ray because mm-hmm. when we finally got the Blu-ray player, I there was a few movies I liked a lot that I needed to get like a a Blu-ray version of. It's still Blu-ray is still the highest quality version of a movie you can buy it it blows streaming out of the water just by the nature of the playback yeah. what about um, like that isn't there like a higher blu-ray thing now 4k 4k blu-ray 4k blu-ray yeah. but i that's not going to get any mar- ma- like market saturation of that compared to blu-ray or even dvd yeah is, i mean the thing yeah. is that was always the problem with is that people had a hard time discerning the difference between dvd and blu-ray the uh, mm. normal consumer was like, it looks fine. Why do I? I mean, you have to remember that when HD streaming first came out on Netflix, it was a lower bit rate than DVDs were. So mm. now it looks good, but there was a long period of time where streaming was not actually significantly better than what you were getting on a DVD and yeah. using like an HDMI upscale deck because those yeah. came out, you know. And now you have the option in a lot of streaming sites that asks you, are you doing this over metered connection? Do you want, do you have sure. Wi-Fi? Do you have, mm-hmm. hard, you know, it's like you got to play that whole game. Right. So what were we saying though? What, what, what were we saying when we started recording about, about Best Buy? Um, oh, oh, well I had said, yeah. Oh, I was just saying about how, um, when, cause I had to go and get the, um, the new, um, Xbox controller. And Nicholas and I ended up going into Best Buy to um, uh, to get it, and I was like, "Wow, there's like no movie." Like I hadn't been in the Best Buy for I can't remember years. I mean, a long, long time. Um, when oh, when they still sold anime, which you would think that they could make money off of anime, but apparently not. And we walked in there, and it's just it's just all they do is sell they sell smartphones smartphone accessories and computers yeah. and yeah they actually were selling like components which i was really surprised about oh uh, i mean they um, always had like a video card section but like motherboards not so much did they have motherboards there i ah they did 
Yeah, that's kind of that's kind one, of interesting. Oh, there's, there's one, one there's one glass. motherboard. <laughs> there's one motherboard behind glass. They had a bunch of uh, graphics cards, uh, cooler towers, a bunch a, a bunch of things. But yeah, it was. Um, so yeah, and I was like, okay, where's the DVDs and movies and stuff? And it was like this this wire end cap rack thing, and it was it was like, oh terrible looking and everything looked like it was like service merchandise like stuff was out of boxes and mm. it's just i don't know how the company stays around still i uh i i what i was saying to you was that i i do think that we are we will hit a resurgence of physical media in in one way or another assuming the plants survive the the, the downturn happening because mm. we are we are headed for a uh streaming bubble to burst yeah. It, okay. It, yeah. No. There, there's they're, they're increasing fees. They're diluting service quality, like you were saying, a- adding yeah. ads to Prime and encroachment like of that. ads. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And like Hulu had already like already had ads, and you had to pay an extra premium on top of your subscription. Yeah. And even after you did that, there were certain shows like I know Gray, Erica watches Grey's Anatomy, where you still had to watch the ads, and it's like I'm not paying for the ads, yeah. but I That's yeah, it's just terrible. Yeah, it's like everything, everything fell apart. The entire plan of using streaming was to not have this happen, and yeah, not have that it was the whole point so of cutting fractured. the cord, supposedly. Yeah. Not and having now, it become so fractured. And now yeah, it's the cord has reconnected. <laughs> it's. I think it's probably worse than cable was. Yeah, the thing about the thing about cable is that you kind of had to plan your watching schedule around your life you know when we were kids growing up you know you had you're like okay uh frazier if you want to watch frazier this week you got a plan to be home at this time unless you got your vcr set up to record tgif was on fridays saturday morning cartoons was here you know things like now it's like you can just watch anything you want you know on your fingertips computer tv smartphone you know anywhere you are that you can get connection um but the problem also is that kind of similar to in a way with tv is that a lot of streaming stuff is sort of like you can only watch what's on streaming as to what is available on that particular stream site because after netflix was like you know the the the, you know the golden goose of the whole group and then eventually the whole thing shattered and everybody started making their own you know sub streaming service that was Um, yeah it's such a nightmare it's so bad now it's become seriously like cable where it's like everything you want to watch is like on a different channel it's, it's all a la carte because i remember mm-hmm. when hulu had the criterion collection was part of hulu and i signed up for hulu to watch that and then hulu lost the criterion channel and it went someplace else and then that then and now it's its own thing mm-hmm. so it's like okay is it worth just subscribing just criterion yes yeah, so now it's, it's yeah so i'm like yeah. okay i'm done i don't need to be um, part of this. what's the other thing uh sesame street it's HBO, isn't it? HBO yeah, or Max, Max or whatever Max. it is. Yeah, and now I heard they are going to be changing their entire format, where it's going to be supposedly episodic, or like Wait, it's going, going to be, be like a s- narrative that's going from episode. Yeah, it's oh, well, God. I think it's going to be like a single. The way they describe it is that it's going to be like a single story, going through the whole thing, and there's going to be like animated portions in of Sesame Street stuff in the Sesame street episode. It's, and there's a lot of talk about the reason for that is that they've, you know, up until the nineties, they really had no competitor when it came to children's educational programming. Um, and they've just gotten hammered over the past few decades where that's why they've kind of been kicked onto, a, you know, cable streaming network that nobody has really. Right. Wait, so you're saying that it's going to be like, a, like a story that covers one season okay it's, well it's it's I, guess, I don't know if i can call it narrative like that but it's like it's like a single story like each episode it's his own st- like there's they, a singular story in the whole episode that wasn't how it was before kind of not they had some stuff that kind of connected to like a main idea was, but i think no. i think this is going to be far more concrete in the gotcha. way that they're describing it i always thought that it was all of the like big bird oscar the grouch 
humans segments were like were like one story and then you had like interstitials with here's how a saxophone is made here's yeah. going to a chinese restaurant <laughs> i th- i th- well that was more like mr rogers type of thing and no, stuff no, no, no. or did they have it in sesame street it's sesame street come on man how to go remember. to russia you don't remember but I, well i think well really nobody our age watched sesame street into the 90s and I feel well, like that was people, when Elmo took over. Mm-hmm. I think that's another thing why a lot of people got turned off by Sesame Street is that there was something else that can watch the kids, and Sesame Street went way too hard into just being the Elmo <laughs> show, where you, none of these characters mattered anymore at this point. And it's like, you know, they'd show up once in a blue moon. You know, Grover puts on the Super Grover costume and. I always pretended that um, Elmo was a drug dealer and, or, or a mobster and people owed him money and that's why they would disappear eventually. So, yeah, like they used to do these cool little sections where they would go like explain some culture's customs or I know they definitely did a... How saxophone saxophone because it's like creepy oh maybe with the a, music in the a, background yeah it may be like a yeah <gasps> saxophone yeah, 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 factory yeah. okay yeah yeah and um, yes i remember it was like it was like a sheet and you're like well, how does the saxophone come from the sheet of yeah. metal and like the music is just like oh, i i can't hear it either actually oh wait there we go <laughs> But so it was educational, and this was like in between. I imagine a Pepe dancing in the back. <laughs> <laughs> you have these educational segments in between. I, that was cool. I like that. Yeah. It's, but speaking of our uh, remnants of our youth, yeah, Alex, uh, I, I'm not sure what this is, AOL and Yahoo. You had a question about We can AOL skip this segment. We can, we can skip, skip. Well, you were saying, skip. okay. Well, sp- hey, Alex, speaking well, base- of. Yeah. Go, no, go ahead. <laughs> you slow <Good>. bitch. <laughs> we can Got skip it. it. Well, actually. All right. So, Alex, what, what what's about what's wrong with AOL? So, uh, I kind of have been on this kick recently about going through a retrospective um look at the internet and how the internet used to be back then and is now um, and the millennial long ago used, yeah millennial and, and i feel like aol was something that was while eventually a, you know it started off for everybody's portal into the internet it sort of became the website for the boomers like a portal to get, i never no. i never i never had aol okay um <laughs> and then like yahoo used to be kind of a more of a hip modern cool thing and that kind of geared towards gen x so we're talking about a home page yeah like a home page okay. yeah like a, i guess search portal i don't even know what those were called gateways no, what, was was a, what was the term it was a search engine search engine okay okay <laughs> so then for the millennials was it google it had to have been because I, I mean i remember using let's see i think i used alta vista mm. a lot there, <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> mm. That's not that's a name I've not heard for a long time. Alta Vista, um, Yahoo. There was Ask Jeeves before it just became Ask dot com. Yeah, I guess it was Ask dot com. They they, they 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 bumped off the butler. Um, Excite. Do you remember Excite? Excite? Yeah, that was. I don't remember who owned that. Um, and then Duck, I Duck actually, Go. what was it? Was it Duck Duck Go? Was another one. DuckDuckGo like still thing. exists. DuckDuckGo okay. is uh, was an offshoot what of about Bing? Google. Does Bing still exist? Bing still exists. I've actually been having better luck with DuckDuckGo Duck, 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 and Bing these Bing. days. Google's kind of not as great as it used to be. It's pretty questionable. I've I've, I've discovered lately, hmm. uh, and that you you got you were intrigued by my Yandex search engine the other day when you saw my desktop the reason i have yandex is because it's on it's like completely uncensored google and all the american search engines basically will block things for copyright reasons or whatnot yeah yandex don't give a 
about U.S. copyright. So there are plenty of things that you're going to find really what you want searching on Yandex. <laughs> Anything legal, Alex. Jeez, what is going on? <laughs> Did you say, say you Don't open look at the light. You opened the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> Dear Lord. Um, what are oh, you looking is, at? Is it, the, is, it, is it like a bunch of Slava booze? It's Russian. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's a bunch of Slava booze. I mean, there's a dark, there's a dark mode for you. Go next up, Matt. <laughs> um, anyhow, um, I don't remember where I was. Oh, so, but I remember when Google arrived and made it. It's creepy. <laughs> made it creepy? No, the way like my arms here. Oh. And you know, it's, it's like, what is this? It, what is this thing going on? <laughs> Um, it, it, I remember when like the computer labs at school, when they, we suddenly switched over to Google. Mm -hmm. So like that was high school. So that would yeah. have been 90, 99, 99, 2000, late nineties, early 2000s. Yeah. Right. And that's when it turned, that's like prime millennial years. And that's when it switched over to Google. And now it's just, it is just Google. You know? Yeah. It's just, I mean, they always show like. You know, you see those infographs going like, oh, what, how many people use this browser and this thing? Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's always just Google and then it's like this power gap. <laughs> and then just everybody else is picking up the crumbs for second place. But still, yeah, I'd say, I would say that, that was the search engine of choice for millennials and now it's just the default. Yeah. And can I also say something about Google um, and YouTube specifically is that they always talk about how much it costs for them to operate it and how they're always losing money. And quite frankly, it's like, do you do realize that there's other components of Google alphabet that makes a, a godly amount of money? And really it's more of like, it's a receptacle for just pretty much a lot of audio visual internet experiences well, and events and stuff like that at this point. It's I, kind of like the Wikipedia for, version I, of video. I think that Google search is certainly profitable youtube may not be profitable they, right, i've, I've right. yet to i've yet to see a headline of first year youtube is in the black yeah. the thing is is that most of there's the the famous saying if it's if 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 it's free to use the product you are the product so mm -hmm. youtube is a gold mine of user data mm -hmm. in, in anything you can imagine yeah and that was what the that was good enough for them up until recently. Yeah. And people seem to be fine with Facebook doing that, and they they're fully accepting of that. You know, no matter how many things you've heard about Facebook old over people. the past twenty years, yeah, old well, people are fine with it. The millennials are not the millennials. We are the old people now. Yeah. We're old, and the old are gone. <laughs> Anyhow, my point mm -hmm. is, is everybody should be using Yandex. <laughs> Stop selling your data to the the uh, American government and start selling it to the Russian government. Is there, like uh, a, is, is there a Taiwanese search engine? Um, can I use that? I wouldn't be too quick to jump on the Taiwanese bandwagon. No. no. <laughs> um, eh. We're going to put some boots on the ground. In Taiwan? I don't I've know. heard stories. Right. Oh, oh, Alex heard stories on the internet. Is this on, is this on K? No, 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 no. This is, no, no, no. It's just the mm. internet. Mm -hmm. The internet. Mm. All right, use DuckDuckGo. It was on. Right. It was on cooking, cooking and food. It's on TV. I heard a lot of. Yeah. There's a lot of political so, talk on TV. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Marine balls been canceled, boys. Um, so because I was doing this, I kind of wanted to go and see. Could I somehow get my old Facebook account, or I'm sorry, my MySpace account back? And like Brendan shaking his head, it was no, it does exist, but it is exceptionally broken because MySpace itself is exceptionally broken. Um, the main page is still showing, look at this thing, it, half of the pictures don't even load. <laughs> They're still showing summer tours for bands from last year. The Rolling Stones are kicking off their, their tour March 14th of 2022. Yeah, it, it just it, it, it's like it's almost two years old. How do you operate? Like, what is the what is like the annual who's pay, yeah, operating who's, cost of this website? Who's paying the who's paying yeah. the bill for this? <laughs> why who 
like how is the light still on suppose i i've been trying to find stuff about that i was looking about like different types of oh my god this is my this is definitely my account yeah yeah like so our old accounts are on there but i can't get into there because wait so what i did is that i basically created myself all over again i made a brand new account for myself so i could try and become friends because they have this whole circles thing and stuff and i try to you know get in there and stuff no i'm, I'm listening um so even when i go in there and i'm like okay maybe it's just the front page maybe everything else fine i get in there it's still broken it's super janky none of it's working you know, celebrities that posted on there, some of them haven't posted anything since 2016, and it's probably based upon them simply just making the profile on there, which is kind of weird because at that point, MySpace was already destroyed. So I'm just trying to, like, last time I heard anything, I was trying to see, um, you know, how many people still work there, and supposedly it's like they've got like 150 people that work in some building out in California, but I don't know what they honestly do on this thing. <laughs> I want to see if I can. I want to see if I can get my account back. Okay. I don't know what my uh, email address was with this. Um, because you got to go back twenty years practically. I do. Rem who who was in your? Who remember it was like you choose your top ten people. Yeah. Who was who was who was in your top ten? I think it was like you, Erica. Yeah. Uh, Stu, the bros and the girls, the bros and the girls, um, angry video game nerd. <laughs> I forgot he was on there. Uh, he forgot he's on there too. See, and then here's the thing. Use Facebook or Twitter to email or your email. And I tried doing that and it didn't work either. Mm. And it's like, so do you, so you remade your, your account? Yeah. Can so I, I basically have to, you? yeah. What's yeah. your, what's your, what's your username? Alex, I mean, it's just oh, it's, it's Alex. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I mean, nope. Okay, well, <laughs> you just remade it. Oh, there it is. Yeah, oh, look at it. That's my original one. <laughs> There's your top eight. <laughs> that was right. Erica, me, Stu, Paul, Angry Video Game Nerd, The Boars, and Bernstein Show. Oh, they're a Chicago sports talk station. Gotcha. And it looks like Angry Video Game Nerd's account is still... Oh, no, never mind. Yeah, it's just... It, it, it's just... It's a, it's a cemetery. It is a cemetery. It's, yeah, it's, it's the worst museum in the history of the world. <laughs> it's the worst museum. And then I, like, I... I can't get my... Yeah, okay, in the past few months, I've kind of got, hopped on to facebook to see what's going on there and it's just and, and i think it's after pretty much after facebook if you didn't make a linkedin there's really no way of somebody finding you on the internet because uh, you know because you know linkedin's very specific for your actual like everybody around their age bracket at this point if they would have been mature and adult like they would have ended up making a linkedin and tried to purge everything banned but it's you know, at the, at the, at pretty much at that point, it's just like there's really no way of finding somebody on the internet. I do you, like know where they look, where they live, their name. You know, I do find it irritating that I'm very easy to find on the internet, and nobody else that I know is <laughs> like I can't stalk any ex girlfriends or yeah. any. Um, I mean, aside from one girl that I found her wedding registry, and I was like, oh, okay. Um, but other than that, uh, it's very hard. No. And like people from high school and grade school, I can't. high school, grade school, college, college, even I just, yeah, I didn't know. Post college. I just, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Stu has some stuff that I've found what he's up to. Mm -hmm. Um, Pat a bunch Purcell, of girls from just a little tiny bit is up yeah. there. A few people from college I can still kind of find. Um, oh, one of our classmates from high school, I know, he, I found his website because he's got a, a law firm in Geneva. So That sounds like our classmates. <laughs> yeah. So in case you need one, I can hit you up on a, on you, a, form, on a, on a fellow alumni. You um, and I are like such black sheep for our high school. Well, 
we have a YouTube channel. <laughs> That's even more so. embarrassing. <laughs> this kind of relates to something we're going to talk about in our review, but Ghibli Park guests apologize for taking lewd photos with characters. Uh-oh. <laughs> I, um, I, I kind of like this one. <laughs> Which is, he's taking an upskirt photo of, this is, I don't know what movie this is. That's more pathetic than the guy on the right-hand side. Well, that's a child, for one thing, that makes it I know, extra but inappropriate. But at the same time, like, this, this is, is more of like a gaggy type of thing. That's more like, I'm, uh, is there I actually think, something up there? But this is kind of, <laughs> I think this is funnier, though. <laughs> it's funny. Like, this turns into, like, parody almost. <laughs> Um, and this is, um, she's from that movie we just watched, Tales from Earthsea. Oh, God, I'm surprised they would acknowledge that there. Right, that's true. <laughs> you make a good point. Ghibli Park guests apologize for taking lewd photos with characters. Three men who admitted to posting obscene photos taken with display characters in Japan's Ghibli Park reportedly apologized to local officials last week. Images of guests pretending to molest characters at the theme park in... Nagakute Aichi Prefecture began circulating on social media last month. In one photo, a male visitor can be seen taking an upskirt photo of Marnie, uh, a 12-year-old character from the 2014 Studio Ghibli film when Marnie was there. So there we go. It was not immediately clear how many visitors had taken such lewd photos, which have since been compared to other malicious trends. Over the last weeks, Japan has also dealt with sushi terrorism pranks in which restaurant diners film themselves tampering with food or utensils. The three male guests, who have not been identified, reportedly visited the Aichi Prefectural Government Office on March 22nd to apologize. Uh, an acquaintance who described the men as remorseful helped organize the meeting. So, the official initially considered taking legal action against those who have engaged in such behaviors but opted to forgive the men. I would like to sincerely accept their apology. I would like to end this matter now. Okay. And there's some other... Ooh, comments. There's some Surprisingly, other... <laughs> I love comments on the story anymore. <laughs> there's some other... Here's some other pictures of uh, things that were happening. So another upskirt, and then they're, like, abducting her, which is even <laughs> creepier. Even creepier than the other one. I mean... Well, funnier. <laughs> the creepier they get, the funnier they end up becoming. <laughs> I just find this hilarious... <laughs> Because of how deadly serious they're taking it, yeah. Like they're like maybe because it's great is it because it's Ghibli? Shame, maybe. If it was Madhouse, would they even give? It? Like, yeah, they're like they make Ninja Scroll. What else? <laughs> it's like what do you expect? <laughs> Having <laughs> sexual innuendo is part of Madhouse's entire. Well, also MO. It's, a, it's it's a little weird how they just have like this statue, like just these statues there, like of the characters like why well, I, yeah, I understand Ghibli, that makes sense but it's just like i don't know what ghibli park looks like normally isn't it just like a it's like a i think it's a like an outdoor museum well is this the same thing as the museum no see this is something different oh it's different so check check this out so we got so Ooh. here's the website um what is Ghibli Park? Ghibli's Grand Warehouse. Valley of Witches. So that's um, Mononoke Village. <gasps> Ooh. Oh, it just opened. Just opened. So I guess they're just, it's just like an expansion to it. Isn't it? It's an expansion. <laughs> the expansion pack. Oh, wow. Wow. Director's Dude, room. We need to go. Philosophy Club room. Oh, that's from up on Poppy Hill. Mm -hmm. Exhibition, open warehouse. They're showing Goro some love. The cafe. May and the May baby kid. Oh, they've cat. got... Oh, my God. They've got, like, short films. May and the baby cat bus. Oh, my God, Alex. How have we not seen this? This is amazing. <laughs> Alex and I are like now lost in, in the Ghibli Park. I'll tell you one thing. If Alex and I went to the Ghibli Park, we would not 
molest. No, no. <laughs> the statues. We, we'd be too busy, like, enjoying, like, the, the cutesy little, like, drinks and, like, like dessert snacks at the cafe. I mean, oh, my God. Uh, your boys would love, would love this. Uh-huh. Oh, oh my yeah. God. This is adorable. Oh, cool. I want to go to there. This is That's pretty cool. So awesome. Pretty, pretty cool. Oh, there's some... There are some YouTube videos that we'll be sure to check out. But anyway, <clears throat> I think it's hilarious that they take it so seriously. And then they're like, they're like, we we're, we're considering legal action because some idiots took dumb photos. Stupid shit. Yeah. Like, how, what can you possibly sue over? Even in Japan. Um, public and decent. Like, it's a th- th- there would be some sort of thing. I know, but they would be like, it would probably be like, um, disturbing the peace or some something like that it's probably be like you're you're banned from the park for whatever period of time i mean i feel like this happens all the time in the united states with statues yeah nobody cares mm-hmm. yeah nobody cares i mean they yeah people do way worse stuff to statues in the u.s too and and they they don't, they don't do anything not even slap on the wrist but i think it's because these guys were taking photos and probably posting on social media and I wouldn't be surprised if they were like tagging Ghibli on it. And Ghibli's like, Oh, we got mentioned here. And it's like, Oh, they, uh, they're taking upskirt pictures of Marnie. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. I might have to block this. <laughs> oh my God. Look at his face. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. All right, so. <laughs> okay, the one with the magazine is pretty funny. <laughs> All right, so my point is, is like this photo, this photo in particular, and then this one. <laughs> this happens in the US all the time, and nobody from McDonald's is like, oh, we demand apologies. <laughs> Come on, Japan, have some fun with it. We probably sold more Big Macs here. Or God, Big Mac. Yeah, Big Macs during that time. I, I thought I was saying Whopper. Whopper in my head. Yeah. Um, but so Japan loses its over uh, a couple of silly photos taken with statues at a Ghibli park. Um, meanwhile, there is rampant cheating and prostitution. <laughs> yeah, that's something that was interesting. Um, there was a there was a ch- one of those like man on street channels of a, a resident of Japan local. Um, from there and there's a bunch of different channels like that but um, he kind of went around the streets asking a lot of people which I think they were kind of in the mid 30s early to mid 30s bracket um, and he was asking them that they're unbeknownst to us really the uh, question about do you because apparently prostitution in Japan is kind of a, a ongoing regular thing which is I'm surprised about. I never knew about this. I was there twice. Never. Um, and they were asking that if you were to go and, you know, get the services of a, a lady of the night, if you would see that as being cheating. And surprisingly, a lot of people said no. Or for the most part said no, apart from if there was something where after services were rendered, and the person started having an emotional attachment to the individual, then in that sense, it would be kind of be seen as cheating. But if it's kind of like, you know, you go there, it's one and done. You wash your hands afterwards, hopefully, because STDs. Um, uh, washing your hands isn't the part that prevents STDs. They don't know. Uh, it would be fine, which I was just like, huh, that's very interesting. Because I'm pretty sure outside of Japan, and, and granted, this is within this, you know, mid-20s to mid-30s age bracket. Sorry, that was me. Oh, um, I believe it would be kind of seen as like, yeah, this isn't something that's highly, that's taken lightly in, you know, outside of Japan, even within that this particular age bracket, like younger than us even. Um, but I think it's just like a societal thing, which was, but it was still very surprising that you would hear this considering everything we kind of 
assume we know about Japan and Japanese culture and stuff like that. But yeah, it was, it was just kind of like, hmm. They have yeah, no issues with that. Sorry, I was looking for the uh, the video. It's funny to me though because I don't know. In 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 cinema and anime, they definitely present themselves as having more Western attitudes towards cheating. Mm. So if if like I was just watching an episode of Yamishibai because it was Halloween last night, and in it the woman's like pissed off that she finds lipstick on her husband's collar and it smells like perfume. So they, they, it's the same traditional angry housewife thinks husband is cheating that you find in a million Western productions. So it's, it's, it's curious to me that they present themselves that way, but then apparently you go talk to people on the street and they're like, Oh yeah, no, I don't care if he's going to prostitutes as long as he doesn't bring me any diseases and doesn't fall in love. Yeah. But Japan yeah, is weird about the word love in general too. Like I feel like it's just a That's part of why I don't think why well, don't I just feel like I don't I, although there are some like uh uh kimono kimono mom where like the love in that family like is very just like you can like like everyone like that's a very close family Mm -hmm. that and like with her little girl and her husband they they that family seems to be a traditional nuclear family Mm -hmm. um but there's there's yeah it's it's a little off-putting to see them talk about this show so nonchalantly as a as an outsider sort of like "Eh, i don't like the sound of this at all so the women think that it's okay for them to cheat then I don't it from the interview it sounded primarily like it was it was kind of more geared towards like the guys going and doing something like this. Mm-hmm. Well that um, I mean on some level that's because uh, the uh you know Japanese and like Chinese culture is still very much patriarchy and I'm not using that in the 2016 term but yeah. more in the yeah. just the nature of the of the how the household yeah. is structured. Right. Yeah, I like to call it best triarchy. Um, but uh, yeah, Save even the girls complaints to contact at culturetown.com. <laughs> Care of we uh, know attention, you won't. attention, Alex. There's no email box. It's true. Um, Pretty soon there won't be actually. <laughs> um, but it was it was interesting because the women seem to be the ones also kind of being like, oh no, that's fine. You know that what they need to do. Sometimes they want to do you know, but don't want a relationship. And then some of the guys were kind of like. Uh, I'm I'm on I'm on camera right now. I can't, yeah, I, gotta, I mean, you know, I gotta, mm. Japan Japan yeah. is like the epicenter of AI girls. You know, mm-hmm. it's the in the hikikomori, like you said, is yeah. that's where that started. And so it it's there's enough Japanese sexual mores are very complex. Um, I mean, you know. The U.S. is quickly joining them into the negative birth rate category, like a lot of countries are. Um, but still, it just like it, the, the Japanese, let's say, I was going to say mating rituals, but like, <laughs> like for example, love hotels in the United yeah. States, in most of Europe and all of Europe. In fact, I'd say probably the rest of the world. You go out to a bar and you meet you meet someone and you are into each other and you want to take that person, you want to have sex together, you go back to someone's house. Mm -hmm. In Japan, you go rent at a hotel room, either for a few hours or for the night, but often just for for a few hours. It's very transactional. Yeah, I mean, you could do that still in the U.S., but it's like, no, it's you only going to cost you. Yeah, no, I mean, that's if you're... It's a credit card. You're cheating. If you're cheating, you go to hotels. Because you don't want your wife to know. Oh. You're do, you've been doing it wrong, Alex. <laughs> Stop bringing girls home. Eric is going to find out one of these days. Um, Nicholas is like, I have another mommy Another now. mommy. Um, but I, the I, third one this week. Because I do think it's strange that, they, that that's like the protocol. And that if you tried to take a girl home with you, they'd be weirded out and think you were going to murder them or something. I find yeah. it's, it's just so foreign to me as a concept. Mm. 
Um, yeah, or they think I think I think in their minds that that you're like making more of this relationship than they think right it's going to be like so there's like that weird protectiveness of homes in japan and i remember uh shuchan shunchan that guy he was talking about how like no one you basically say it's something like you have to say to the person like if you're out having drinks on a date and you say something like do you want to get some rest and that's code for do you want to go to a love hotel and what you can say is, do you want to go have some rest? I know you guys are confused, but let me explain. So in love hotels, usually there are two options, stay or rest. Stay literally means staying at the hotel for the night and rest means staying there for only a couple of hours. That's why saying, do you want to go have some rest can mean, do you want to go to a love hotel? Culturally, there's an incompatibility there and you find it all the time in um, expatriates who end up, you know, getting with other expatriates not with dating a native japanese girl they end up with a westerner like uh, a broad in japan guy right now he's dating an american Mm -hmm. from like michigan (laughs) you know and he even says in his videos that he's dated japanese girls and it's just a really big divide on protocol and expectations of what this is going to be yeah which is very interesting because when you go and decide to permanently you know you know, settle down there, that you would be, you know, one of those things is that your social life would basically be, hopefully not to be, move to Japan and become Hikukomori, that you basically um, go there and you'd start interacting with the locals and then, you know, it just for whatever reason doesn't work out. It's just like, hmm. Yeah, there's there's always been the luster of, of, as I've quoted before, one of my acquaintances said, when I moved to Japan, I was a Japanophile. Now I just live here. It's Mm -hmm. when you actually are, are, it just turns into another country with its own problems and its own hangups and its own own weirdness, same way as the United States and Canada, especially Canada and, Mm. (laughs) and the UK, especially the UK, you know? So it's just like, we're all, you know what? It's because we're all just humans. Mm -hmm. We we should, we should get along and love each other. (laughs) And I made I made that comment also. Um, I think I texted you or something. But it was like when you take a look at Westerners, like gaijin that live out in Japan, and you kind of look at their phenotype, they look like somebody that you would imagine that lives out in Japan. They're they're these you could tell that they're just like you're an interesting looking individual. You know, it's just like there's this, this certain characteristics That's physically. Trying- trying to find if anyone has ever like compiled like tokidoki well there is australian there is there is like this guy this type of guy who shows yeah, who yeah. shows up on like nhk you know yeah, yeah there's the yeah. weird nhk or, uh, presenters who it's another matt alt is another one he does some nhk stuff and i think he also does like translations and some other stuff like that but like there, there's um uh, uh, Felix uh, Felix Shelberg and his wife. Um, <laughs> I love how I love how I typed in Western white men who live in Japan, and it gives me Hikikomori. <laughs> There's the problem with Google right there. And oh, yeah. that's another thing. I I really can't stand those types of videos where it's like the person who's like, "Oh, I speak this language," and I go in some rustic village and I just start spouting off. We've and talked, people are just like, "Oh, we talked about this before," where there was like a little bit of a controversy in the YouTube community of the people that are like, "Was it Toki Doki was involved in that?" No, it was uh, Oriental was Pearl. Oh, Oriental Pearl. Okay. And then there was like the guy in like in uh, Chinatown in New York who goes and speaks fluent Mandarin. Was he like the polyglot or some shit? Yeah, it's the the polyglot. Like, it's like <laughs> I don't know. I think it's cool. I wish I could speak anything like that. All I can say is, uh, well, beforehand you want you wanted to become a polyglot, and when you became a polyglot, you just speak a bunch of different languages. Man, yeah. Alex, yes, baby. <laughs> we um, speaking of Japan. <laughs> You and I watched the second of three Goro Miyazaki films. We saw the second Goro Miyazaki joint. Two of two. Two Two of two. 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 We don't talk about the third film. Um, It's called uh, um, From Up on Poppy Hill. 
from Up on Poppy Hill. Written by Hayao Miyazaki. Yeah. Adapted from a graphic, or not graphic novel, a manga series, I believe. But maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a manga series, yeah. Um, kind of a uh, slice of life-ish show? A uh, period piece slash slice of life. Um, also a post-war period piece, I would say. Post-World War II, post-Korean War, surprisingly. Um, actually taking place in, like, the early 60s. Prior yeah, I to forgot, you're right. Yeah, yeah, the six, mm-hmm. uh, I think it was, like, what was it? It was, like, the 62 Olympics, 64 Olympics, something like that in Japan. Japan hosted, like, the, their first Olympics, um, or first post-war Olympics. I don't know how many they've had. But yeah, it was going to be like the early 60s Olympics that they ended up having out there, which this kind of coincides prior to it. <clears throat> Although it kind of had this 1950s feel to it. Maybe just the way that this particular location in the movie uh, was. It is somewhat. set in 1963. Okay, so. Yeah. Set in 1963 in Yokohama, Japan. Yokohama. The film tells the story of Umi Matsuzaki Nagasawa. I don't know why that's in... Oh, that's the actress. Never mind. A high school girl living in a boarding house. Mm-hmm. Kalikat? 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 Is that how that's pronounced? Kalikat. I mean, I'm looking... I'm just looking at the Wikipedia. Kalikat. Poppy. Man, it's, it's French for for, for poppies. Oh, name. okay. Thank you. Uh, when Umi meets Shun Kazama, Shun Shun Kazama, a oh. member of the school's newspaper club, they decide to clean up the school's clubhouse, the Latin Quarter. However, Tokumaru, the chairman of the local high school and a businessman, intends to demolish the building for redevelopment. And Umi and Shun, along with Shiro Mizun Mizunuma Mizunuma. <laughs> Must persuade him to reconsider. They're trying to, to tear it down for the uh, to make room for a uh, like. <laughs> Alex just got blown out again. <laughs> make room for the Olympics, essentially. What a what a classic like eighties type of storyline. Like evil businessman, we got to band together and save the ski lodge, guys. <laughs> save oh, Kokoliku. the ski. Kokoliko is the way you say it in French. That's why my face is blown up from translate. <laughs> Kokoliko manner. Kokoniku? Kokoliku. Kokoliku. That's not I'm how it's spelled. I'm just going by what, it's going by it. <laughs> I, I know, but it's it's what Google is saying. Alex, what did you, you think question? of From Up on Poppy Hill? From Up on Poppy Hill, I actually enjoyed it more so than I did Tales from Earthsea. Well, that's a pretty low bar. You did not enjoy yeah. Tales from Earthsea. Piece of- did you um, enjoy From Up on Poppy Hill? Did I enjoy it? Yeah. Yes, I actually. Yeah, I actually enjoyed it. I liked oh, it quite. Shut a- up, Windows Defender. I enjoyed it quite a bit. I was shocked. It was shocking. <laughs> it was probably because it was okay. Here's the thing: since it was screenplayed by by Miyazaki Senior, mm-hmm. even though it's Goro and Hayao and whatever. Goro, Goro, Miyazaki the Elder did the screenplay of it. He was probably able to go ahead and infuse in that a lot of the standard uh, expected um, Ghibli style type of themes, where it's like you know it's it's a it's a it's this slice of life. It's this picture of something happening that's going on in these people's lives, the setting, mm-hmm. the characters. Um, even though it's an adaptation, but you know, still at the same time, he takes you know, he's he can take some creative, you know, yeah. liberties with that. But no, I agree. I was shocked by how enjoyable this film is. It reminded me of it has this excitement of youth that's like infused in it to its core, and it's like mm-hmm. the the animation is so much better than Tales from Earthsea. The characters are so yeah. endearing. Like there's, it, like you it's know, a complete one eighty. It definitely feels more like a Ghibli film. There's mm-hmm. no real bad guy. It's all just this kind of looming. We want like all of the like rebuilding, like t- t- fixing up the clubhouse and all of those characters in the clubhouse 
are yeah. all just so endearing and likable mm-hmm. and fun. And it's just, it's a great little movie. I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> I was like yeah, shocked by how good this was. And I think the budget was around the same as it was for Earthsea or something. Yeah, but I'm not sure. It was like, it, I feel like it's it, it, like they got more more miles out of each dollar during this. I mean, part of it for sure is the fact that, um, what's his name? Uh, Goro was a more experienced filmmaker who learned something from it, from his mm-hmm. per- previous experience. Yeah. Uh, $22 million budget, $61 million worldwide box office. So I'm not sure how they... So yeah, it's about the same budget. I think it was $20 million for Tales from Earthsea. Excuse me. You're getting as bad as I am. <laughs> um, I felt like there was also a lot more detail in each of the, in the in the in the in the the setting and the the you know than uh, each of the scenes and stuff like that compared to Earthsea and and such. Um, but it was definitely it definitely felt much more, which is weird too because when you look at the art style of of Earthsea, you know, you it's a, it's definitely got you know feelings of like Mononoke. And uh, Shunya's journey, and um, was it Nausicaa and so, so Nausicaa, whatever her name is. Um, so it's definitely got that type of Ghibli feel, in, like style and feel to it. But at the same time, this one also has it, but does it to a much better, um, you know, is able to actually fulfill that type of, I guess relationship or i don't know how it's, to describe it, but it's like, more it's more satisfying overall. yeah satisfying yeah um mm-hmm. yeah and i think that goro would be it would be a good idea for him to continue working in a more um intimate s- story setting and not trying to do these big epic fantasy films which kind of fell flat which but, fell flat. You know, it, the yeah. pacing and the structure was all strange in Tales from Earthsea. You know, and part of it is the writing. Tales mm-hmm. from Earthsea's writing, I thought, was very poor. Um, and he was part of the writing. It was him and some other guy who wrote Tales from Earthsea. So there's right. that. Uh, he definitely had a much better script to work from. And Miyazaki Sr. seems to have a very good handle on storytelling. <laughs> shockingly he knows what he's doing when it comes to con- constructing a, sc- a screenplay um but i still would give goro credit for bringing those words to life and an incompetent filmmaker can still make a mess out of a good script so um yeah i i i think that if you i think that this one kind of gets lost in the ghibli t- tome of cinema the the whole the whole the catalog of of ghibli films i think people don't think about this movie we only talked about it because i think we were making fun of goro at some point like you we (laughs) we have this we have this soft spot for goro oh i was i feel more like goro is more relatable and yeah yeah Uh, well like you were saying like you know it's, it's kind of not mentioned really in the annals of this um just because you know Specifically for Goro, it's like you have his first film, then his last film, or his most recent film, yeah. which I wouldn't be surprised if it's if he's pretty much done with it. So this one kind of unfortunately is is actually a very good one mm-hmm. in his estimate, and you know by, by you know regarding his standards, but it's just it's kind of like the opposite bell curve. It's just yeah. like mm-hmm. as opposed to you know the other ones and stuff. Um, which is unfortunate because I think he also got a little bit more confidence under his belt, a little bit more um, backing and support from the studio, especially his dad doing the screenplay and stuff like that, that he was able to come up with something like this. Um, I do know that Earwig is a TV movie. It was not a theatrical. So it's probably what might be working against it, I guess. There's always the stigma against like made for TV films. Yeah, there's not even a budget listed on on Wikipedia for this film. And it seems like it was only released theatrically. Oh, so there was a th- film version. Like a uh Oh, COVID-19 
impacted it in Japan too. Huh. Anyway. So anyway, uh, Alex, how many pots of gold would you give from up on Poppy Hill? Uh, I'm going to give it, I'm going to end up giving it two and a half pots of gold. Um, it's way lower than I expected, but continue. (laughs) Well, I mean, here's the thing. It's like, it is, um, you know, it is a good movie. It's better than Earthsea. I would say, you know, it's, it improve it fixes and improve. What did you give Tales from Earthsea? Like one, one and a half? I think one or one and a half. Mm -hmm. So this is a full, basically a full star. I don't think. It's a full pot of gold. It's a full pot of star. 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 Full pot of gold. (laughs) Red balloon. This guy. (laughs) <laughs> Red balloon, blue moons. Um, but you know, in, in terms of trying to, you know, to break that three pots of gold threshold, especially for something like, you know, a Ghibli film, it's, you know, it's kind of difficult. I I would say like like Howl's Moving Castle also was like a two and a half, you know, pots of gold. So that, it's just I need to revisit Howl's Moving Castle, but I found. I remember that being an unpleasant film that I did not like. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I probably should give it another shot. shot. Um, I think a lot of these Miyazaki movies, ones that aren't as frequently referenced or talked about, you know, because there's always like the Mononoke's, there's the Spirited Away's, um, Wind, The Wind Rises, I guess is more of a recent one. Uh, I saw that Cagliostro, probably because it deals with Lupin, Nausicaa. So, yeah, I, just... I really want to watch this movie. This is the last film that uh, Isao Takahata, Isao Takahata made. Um, I'm scared of it because it's supposed to be pretty sad. <laughs> like it's, and like he Grave died. of the Fireflies type of thing? I don't... He made Grave of the Fireflies. Well, you know. He made Grave of the yeah. Fireflies also. So he has a... He's not afraid to push that into mm-hmm. like heartbreaking territory. And I heard... I've heard multiple adults be like, this is a tough film. <laughs> like this is... Like this is... You're going to be in tears at the end of this movie. And I just don't, you have to be in the mood for that. And plus the fact that it's Sao Takahata's last film gives it an extra nuance. But so there's these movies that I know I want to see in the Ghibli library that I just have not been able to actually commit to yet. I feel someday like, I will. Yeah, I feel like it's kind of Ghibli movies. There are certain movies, and now you probably have the same thing too, but you, I mean, since... 2001 is your favorite. I mean, you can just kind of do whatever with that. But I feel like there are certain films I've come across in life and I've watched them before that I enjoyed. But in order to rewatch them, I kind of have to make that this almost like preparation to be able to view them again just because of how long they may be or how daunting subject matter wise or how you have to sit. Mm-hmm. You really have to be attentive. You can't just be like, I'll put it on the background while I'm on the computer or I'm cleaning, you know, picking up the house or something like that, you know, uh, apocalypse now is a case like that for me where, you know, just, it's like, it's, it's a very, whole experience. It is. Yeah. And I watched it like last time I watched it was in college, like oh. in some random afternoon and I'm like laying in like my bed. I'm just like, I was like, it was bright when I started. Now it's dark and I need to go pee and I need to eat. <laughs> so um, it's something like that. Like I kind of feel like Ghibli films sometimes are able to, depending upon the film. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I feel like you know this one you can kind of put on, you can be able to enjoy and stuff. Um, but yeah, I'll still I'll, I'll stick with the two and a half. So I would give it three pots of gold. I I found it to just be a fun, life affirming endearing film uh very cute um it was i did like how it started to go down into a weird incest plot (laughs) i was like i was like just like my doujinshi (laughs) 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 i was waiting for for it to be like okay goro has goro and miyazaki are like just going for it and it's going to turn into this weird 
Japanese love situation because the Japanese, even more so than Game of Thrones, love their incest subplots. Yeah. It's like, if I go and see a prostitute, would this be cheating? <laughs> Not if they're blood related. <laughs> um... But luckily, it does not actually do that at all. It's it's very cute how everything is resolved and everything's talked about. And I just, I liked the world. I, I liked that building that all these kids were in and working together. There's no mm -hmm. cruelty in this film. The adults mm -hmm. even are pretty um, level-headed. They go to visit the, the person in charge of the Olympic Stadium stuff, and he's not a dick. He's not aggressive. He's just a guy doing his job. You know, so I appreciate that, especially as, yeah. as now that we're elderly people. I just like watching humans act rational. That's like my escapism. <laughs> it's, just, it's just seeing a bunch of characters who the, the, they don't escalate the conf conflict. They actually are, act like normal people and try to mm -hmm. diffuse things. So I, I was very pleased that there's no artificial conflict in this film. Um, so yeah, Three Pounds of Gold, I would definitely recommend checking it out. Uh, on December 8th, what is almost certainly, unfortunately, going to be actually Hayao Miyazaki's final film is coming out. The Boy and the Heron. The Boy and the Heron. Mm. Are you familiar with this film? I've seen the poster for it. And okay, it's to talk about it being his final film. Yeah, famously, uh, no marketing for this movie in Japan. There has been much more marketing in the United States. Why would that be the case? Well, because they thought that the final Miyazaki movie would be just enough. So there was no trailer. There was no images besides one. Just like a poster? Yeah, that well, that one. It's not even like from the film. It's that. Oh, um, okay. it's it's like that sketch that Miyazaki made. Oh, okay. So, so it that would just was be all, like word of mouth. That was the like, only thing that came out in Japan to promote the film. The United States has got a full trailer. Miyazaki, I guess, wasn't happy about the marketing or lack thereof in Japan. Who would do? Okay, who distributes their stuff in Japan? It's a good question. Does Ghibli do it itself? Are they self? I would imagine maybe they're at the. I mean, because I would think like Toho. Oh, uh, to, uh, mm. at least they did. Toho. So let's say. Um, That's kind of weird. The wind. Because I mean, Ghibli is a studio that's large enough and known enough that they could do themselves. But if it's being distributed by, was it Toho? Yep. Yeah, Toho. Oh, I guess Toho. <laughs> okay well um so alex i think that you and i should try to see this movie <laughs> okay I know, I know that you uh you it might be harder for you to go see um uh the boy and the heron but if at all possible maybe i'll come visit you in december i would take a look and see if there's something around here that's showing it it should be fairly w wide release not you know total it's not like marvel but it shouldn't be like just art theaters. they should at least one theater like, like put one screen like what are you gonna put what the marvels it's like the marvels <laughs> i mean spirited away was everywhere i remember when yeah that spirited was. away got big I saw yeah. that movie like eight times in the theater and not just because I liked the movie. It was because I was skipping my photography class <laughs> and I would go to the theater for actual photography. Yeah. Cinematography and film shot on film. That's why I went to see it was I didn't know if I'd ever see it in a theater again. So anyhow, uh, well, we both enjoyed uh, uh, from up on Poppy Hill. Thought it was a marked improvement from Goro Miyazaki from his uh compared to his debut film tales from earthsea and um yeah i think that about does it this week so alex would you do me a favor and wrap up this week's show certainly uh thank you very much everybody for tuning in and uh listening and watching uh culture doom this was episode 425 okay i got the green light uh, yes, episode 425 of our esteemed program. Um, on behalf of Brendan, this is Alex saying, until next time.